In 2012, two families left the city along with the conveniences of modern American living. It's today that these two families have relocated themselves in the mountains of the American Ozarks to build for themselves a more sustainable and fulfilling lifestyle. We are American Homestead! This week on an American Homestead, it's time this summer to trim the hooves of our sheep. Are livestock really worth the trouble? And then we go check out another nearby family who for the time being is living off-grid, and we check out their amazing off-grid shower. Thanks for watching, and be sure to visit us online at anamericanhomestead.com. As you may have been able to tell in another video, um, we did, my shoes broke and uh, the shoestring broke on these boots. Uh, I've been using these now for about a year. These are, I've gone through a lot of different types of boots over the last couple years of homesteading and um, even giving a whirl. I had, before these pair, I had a pair of Danners. Uh, they were like $350 boots and I got them on sale for like 140 bucks over at LAPoliceGear.com. And I was like, okay, I'll spend the extra money on a really good pair of boots. Because um, usually the kind of boots I buy, I don't spend more than $100 for them. And I said, well, I'm, I'm going to splurge. We'll get the $150 boots that are normally $350. And they were just completely shredded within like eight months, six to eight months. We do a lot of hard work on the homestead. And uh, we put our boots through the rigmarole. And uh, <laughs> they just don't last very long. So... These are New Balance. I've had these for over a year, and so far these have been some of the best performing boots I've had in a long time. Uh, they're just now starting to rip after a year, over a year's worth of work on them. Um, finally, the, uh, the, the, the laces split and, and broke off uh, just yesterday. And so, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to keep using these boots for the rest of the summer. I'm going to get the rest of the summer's use out of them, and then I'll um, go ahead and get some new boots. Um, but... Uh, there's a way to repair these. So I have paracord, and that's all this is basically is paracord. And I don't know if this was the actual, if this is actually real paracord or not, if it's actual the, the the US mil spec paracord. This is, and so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, basically replace uh, these laces with real paracord. I have a thousand foot roll of it. We use it for everything around the homestead. Uh, this just stuff comes in so handy. You can buy it online. I would highly recommend getting some real mil spec paracord. So the first thing we're going to do is take the, the one of the laces that's still good, that's still intact, and I'm going to measure it out and tear off uh, basically a same size length out of the roll of mil spec 550 cord, and we'll go ahead and cut that out. The next thing you're going to do at the end of your 550 cord, you're going to take a lighter, and you're just going to melt the edge of that, keep it intact, just barely, uh, squeeze it down, it's going to be hot, but uh, you just want to melt that just a little bit. So it doesn't fray. It's just polyester fibers. Do that on both ends, and then that'll give you the eyelets you need to be able to go ahead and thumb them through the, the eyelets on your, of your boot. Okay, so I have both new lengths of 550 cord uh, already cut, and they're uh, sealed off at the ends. Uh, they're just melted off at the ends. This is a little trick I just learned when I was in the military. Uh, our laces broke all the time on our boots, and so uh, we just relaced them with 550 cord lacing, and um, it worked great. So this is just something, uh, an easy way to, if your boots aren't worn out yet, but the laces went out before your boots were past their prime, uh, which happens often, at least, at least in my my experience. Uh, go ahead and just use 550 cord to relace your boots, and stuff works great and lasts a long time.
So there you go. Old boots, new laces, ready to go back to work. Sheep are one of those things I think that requires constant monitoring and constant attention. You know, really any livestock is, is that way. And so when you have livestock on a homestead, it's going to require your constant attention and, uh, you know, perpetual upkeep, uh, making sure that they're safe, making sure that they're well fed, they're healthy, um, and that they have overall good, you know, and acceptable living conditions. And you know, there are, I mean, the factory farms that are out there today, that's why I tell people don't buy meat at the store because all the meat you buy at the store is, is raised horribly, they're fed horrible food, their whole lives are kept in close, you know, close conditions, uh, close quarters and horrible conditions their whole lives. And so really the meat you buy at the store is not healthy for you. And you really have to do your due diligence to find farmers who have uh, that conviction in them to raise their food in a healthy manner. And uh, it, that takes some legwork on your part. And so the reason I like having my own sheep here is that I know what goes into them. I know what they're fed. Uh, I know what's acceptable. I know their living conditions. Um, you know, I know what I'm willing to do with my livestock so that my family can have, uh, for the best part, most part, healthy food. Well, lest you think we always agree on the homestead, uh, we have one point of dissension in our ranks here on the homestead. Uh, that is the sheep. Zach likes the sheep, and I don't. The reason I don't is I'm kind of burnt out over them. And this last winter, with uh, hauling hay for them all winter, and feeding them, and breaking up the ice so they'd have something to drink, and it just, uh, it just wore me out. And after winter was over, uh, the sheep got sick, and we lost two ewes and one lamb. And here we are, fewer than sheep than what we had going back uh, a year ago even. And after three years of taking care of sheep, uh, they profited nothing. So I would like to get rid of the sheep, and Zach wants to keep the sheep. So we have this dilemma going on <laughs> that will probably never settle. But in the meantime, we disagree about our sheep. But any type of livestock is going to require effort and work, and I think uh, it's just a matter of you know, are you willing to put in the time. It doesn't matter if it's cattle or if it's sheep or if it's goats or you know chickens or turkeys or whatever. And uh, I think that it, it, you know understanding that it's going to require some work, it's going to require some attention to detail. Um, are you up for it? You know, and people, you know, it's just a matter of do you like doing that? If you don't like doing that, if you'd rather spend your time doing other things, you know, we each of us here on the homestead have our own interests that we'd, we'd like to do, things we like to look over, things we like to, you know, get our hands on approach onto certain projects. And so if, uh, if one project isn't really of interest to you and, you know, having livestock is a project, uh, then, you know, maybe that's not your job. Maybe you don't worry about that so much. And so we have things, each of us, that we like to really oversee and have our hands in. And uh, livestock is one of the things I like doing. I like, um, I like tending the sheep and making sure they're healthy because I like the, the benefits of having them. I like having the meat uh, and having that healthy food source. Uh, here on the homestead, I like the birds. We get good egg production and meat production and they've proven to be a uh, good at providing uh, food and uh, entertainment even here on the homestead. We have uh, various ages of chicks and we have our guineas to take care of the uh, ticks and someday in a few months we're going to even get some turkeys. And I've always liked birds. Even years ago when we lived in California I raised pheasant and quail. I think my girls were six years old before they even ate a chicken or a chicken egg. So it's, uh, I love birds. What I'd really like to do here is have cattle. Um, the Scottish Highlanders is the, the cattle that I'm really looking forward to getting at some point someday. Uh, that's that's the, 
the breed I'd, I'd like to have. But, uh, you know, and, it, and we'll, we will get there. But uh, we decided to hold off on it because really just having one breed of livestock takes some time to learn and master and become familiar with enough so that you can be competent in your care of those animals. And uh, it's a learning curve. And I think we're just starting to get, you know, we've learned a lot and we still have a lot to learn. But as soon as we feel confident that, you know, the sheep are going well, I think that uh, I'd like to take on more livestock like cattle, uh, the Scottish Highlander uh, being a, a prime example of that. We've started building our turkey house. Uh, it's going to be a pretty good size and house uh, turkeys. I plan to get Narganset turkeys because they're good at uh, brooding their own babies. So I've started the foundation, yet to get the lumber, and working on the smokehouse in the meantime, and getting water to the houses. So lots of going on. So I, I kind of get distracted from one project to the other, but we have a good start on our turkey house. So what we're going to do today is go ahead and harvest a cabbage. We are uh, going over to a friend's house for dinner tonight, and Jamie wants to make egg rolls. Uh, I guess the theme is Chinese food or Asian food. And so uh, we're going to harvest a cabbage here so that she can make her egg rolls with that. And uh, what I've learned about cabbages is that you cut them off at the base, and then you leave the roots in the ground because what will happen is over the course of the growing season, it will produce tiny new cabbages if you leave the base roots in place along with a few outside leaves. And some of these leaves are basically, you know, chewed up by bugs, but that's okay. Um, it's just a little bit of minor damage, but mo ma the majority of our cabbages are doing really good. And so what I'm going to do here is just go through here, uh, go underneath here, and cut this at the base while still leaving the base roots in place. There we go. There we go, like that. And so that leaf got disconnected. And, uh, but the rest of these leaves will be here, and this will produce new offshoots. In fact, you can already see one getting started right here. Um, but uh, it, this is going to go ahead and stay in place. And like I said, it'll produce new roots. Now, an amazing thing with brassicas, after your season's over, after your growing season is over, you can take these leaves and all of the, the basically the stuff you would normally compost and just throw it on your garden and brassica leaves brassica plants like this one and broccoli and others will actually act as a fungicide for your garden and so putting these old leaves and composting them right on your garden and letting them break down over your in your garden over the coming winter will actually allow it to produce some antifungal properties in your garden and that helps your tomatoes and other plants that are susceptible to different funguses and things like that so at the end of your year go ahead and take your brassica leaves like broccoli and cabbages and other things and let them just break down in your garden and spread the leaves over your garden and that'll act as a natural fungicide so good deal that's a pretty good cabbage right there we're going to go ahead and take that in the kitchen and let jamie get to work on it So today I decided I would make egg rolls. I've been craving Chinese food and we have nowhere to get Chinese food here in the country. So I decided to, today I would make some egg rolls and we're going to be sharing them with some friends tonight. We were invited for dinner and uh, my friend's making fried rice and I'm making egg rolls. So here we have some fresh cabbage just picked from the garden this morning and Zach brought them in to me. Um, these are just store-bought carrots. Our carrots aren't um, ready in the garden yet. It's not the time of year to pull carrots. So I'm just using store-bought carrots and cabbage. And I'm going to cook that up with a little bit of spices and then roll them up into egg rolls. So I'll show you quick how to core. If you don't know how to core a cabbage, you just cut it in half and in quarters. And then I just lay it flat and use my knife, cut out the core.
Okay, so now I have some flat pieces and I can just easily shred it. Done. So that's that's a simple, fast, easy way to shred cabbage without a food processor. I know a lot of people shred cabbage with a food processor. Moving off grid you got to get rid of most of your kitchen appliances that you've been used to. So I am very thankful that early on when I was learning how to cook, I learned how to chop really well. So um, if you don't know how to chop, it's a really good skill to learn. And there's a lot of YouTube videos I've seen on, if you're just interested in learning how to chop, just Google how to chop. And you'll come up with a lot of good videos. Um, I especially like Alton Brown. I've always loved Alton Brown, who does the Good Eats show. And he has a lot of how-to stuff like that, too. So here in my pot, I have my cabbage, my carrots, just a little drizzle of olive oil just to keep it from sticking, and some garlic and ginger. And I'm just getting it so that the cabbage and the carrots wilt down my, my bowl was completely full to the top, so now it's cooking down a little bit. And I'm just going to cook this for a couple more minutes. The egg rolls are all done and we're gonna go now and have a meal with some friends of ours and I want to show you the, show you their amazing off-grid solar powered shower imagine being able to take a take a shower and the water being heated completely by the Sun using no electricity well that's what these people have done so let's go take a look hello welcome we're a family in Arkansas living off-grid in a hayfield we just moved here been here about a week and a half we've got a shower we'd like to show you it's uh, powered by the sun through some uh, poly something type of plastic tubing. <laughs> so come on, I'll show you. took two pallets, one up top and one down below, took some treated two by fours and we put them on the side and let them out uh, three and a half inches and another inch and a half. So whatever that equals out to be four and a quarter, I think, on each end. And then that put another two by four across so that we could get a two by four this way and a two by four this way for the uprights. And that kind of gave it our corner supports. So there's a pallet up top and a pallet down below. And down on the bottom pallet, Put some uh, decking boards, some five quarter by six inch decking boards. And then we found some of this that's uh, like a rattan type of a blind that we line the inside with. Just some recycled material that we used just to cut down the cost. And then the tubing, like I said, is some poly type of material. It's a half inch tubing and they come in 100 foot rolls. So we took two of those and spliced them together to get 200 feet total. And then we're using our pump off of our RV to pump the water up and then through the coil and the sun heats up the black plastic and it comes up through a through a PVC line and then we've got a little flow valve here that will turn it on and off or slow down the flow to if you want a little bit warmer you slow down the, the water pressure and then just out a standard shower head. 
And then also I ran another line outside in case we wanted to wash our hands or get some hot water for laundry. And that's a rat here on the back. Drains out through there. And another little flow valve that we can empty out into some five gallon buckets and pour it in our laundry if we want to. And this for aesthetics, we put a little window out here back so we could look out into the hay field and see the trees when we're showering. Very cool. And so how long did it take you to build? It took about two days, I think. Just, uh, you know, working maybe three or four hours a day on it. Very so, cool. A little bit of a trial and error on the system. It's working out pretty well. You like it? You enjoy it? It's working real good. Now, if I take a shower during the heat of the day from like noon to four, it's really too hot. Yeah. I like to have some sort of cool water to mix with it. But anywhere after five o'clock in the evening, it's, it's really good temperature to take a shower with. Thanks again for watching and tuning in to our channel at American Homestead. We really appreciate you guys sharing our videos. So what this is about right here is that this is a uh, deer skin that I shot and I skinned, we flushed and we tanned right here on the homestead and it's now on sale at our website at AmericanHomestead.com. We also have a couple other skins. Uh, we have some goat skins that have been tanned and uh, by a friend of ours here locally. Uh, this is a goat that he raised and he uh, skinned and tanned the hide. And also we have some of our sheep, our sheep wool. Uh, that we have harvested and now is for sale on our website. It's raw wool. It's unclean. It's unfiltered. Um, it's going to be need to be cleaned. It's unskirted is how the term goes. And so uh, it's raw wool. If you know somebody who buys raw wool, uh, ours is for sale pretty cheap on our website. You can buy it or uh, forward that on to a friend and let them know about it. And we're willing to sell our wool from our sheep. Or if you have craft projects that you might like to use it in, go ahead and go to our website at AmericanHomestead.com and check out that at the store. And you can purchase our wool directly from us and we'll ship it to your door. All right, we'll leave it at that. We'll see you next time on an American Homestead. It's a good girl.